Okay, I just wanted to real quickly discuss the results uh, of our example problem in the previous video. We did a column design where, um, if I were to recap here, um, up here based on the um, the guess of a failure stress of 16.7, we determined that we need a, a column that has an area of 24 square inches. So we went to the appendix and we found that a W14 by 90 will suit our needs nicely. Um, it has an area of 26.5, which is greater than 24. This is, as a reminder, is just a starting point. This is just a guess. We don't know that the failure stress is 24, um, is 16.7 square inches, so therefore this area requirement of 24 is still just a guess. Um, if it turns out that the beam we chose, or I'm sorry, the column that we chose is too strong, we can uh, choose one that has an area less than this. It is okay. This is not um, a limit that we cannot go below. So after choosing a column that has an area of 26.5 and a radius of gyration of 3.7, we um, determined that uh, because of its slenderness, this is the equation. We have two equations for allowable load. This is the one we needed to use. We found the Euler stress. We plugged the Euler stress into this formula with our other variables and found that the column that we chose, which is a W14 by 90, a W14 by 90, has uh, an allowable load of 480 kips. Now, the load that was being applied to our column was 400. So it is adequate. Our column can resist the loads that are being applied to it, so it's good. The question is, is it too good? If you were uh, an engineer actually designing this column, you would be expected to uh, basically test all possible options. Um, and, and what I would do is I would um, say, well, okay, uh, 14 by 90 worked. Um, so if I go to the appendix and look at the next smallest column, uh, we were limited to a W14 in the problem statement. So I would say, well, okay, uh, W14 by 90 works. How about a W14 by 74? Does that work? And test that. And if that works, go to the next smallest one, a W14 by 61. And just keep trying to get more and more efficient, choosing smaller and smaller columns until you get one that doesn't work. And then, then obviously, we would uh, go with the next biggest column. Um, however, I know that especially on tests, you are somewhat limited in time. Uh, I don't want you to spend an undue amount of time. So I have come up with a recommended guideline here. Um, and this is not in a textbook. Uh, this is not anything out of the AISC. This is just my recommendation as your instructor. Um, make sure that is the capacity of the column that you choose is within 25% of the required load the requirement. So in other words, um, if if I were you uh, and I was, if this were a, a quiz question, I would say, well, okay, uh, I came up with a W14 by 90 and it has a capacity of uh, 480 kips. If I take 480 and compare it to my uh, requirement of 400, multiplied by 100%, then that would give me 480 divided by 400 times 100, and I'm getting 120%. So the column I chose is 120% of its requirement. Or in other words, uh, it's 20% more than is required. 
So that is within the 25%. 20% is less than 25%. So I would suggest to you that if you get a result like this and you do a quick check and see that it's within 25% of what is required, you can then say, okay, that's good enough. I don't need to test anymore. I don't need to waste any more time on this. I'm just going to go with this, the W14 by 90. Okay, and again, this is not an AISC um, regulation. This is not something that's in the textbook. Um, I've just found in the past that students um, can sometimes get uh, a little overwhelmed when designing columns. There's so many options. They don't know uh, how, how many to test. How, how do they know whether they keep going? Um, they can kind of get stuck in a rut and, and um, waste too much time on a test, especially. Um, and so this is my little recommendation here. Try to choose a column that's within 25% of the requirement. Okay, I think in the next video we will look at timber columns.